Hello everyone and welcome to another session with Shobi's live stream. Um, my name is Abdul Chohan. I'm the VP of Learning at Shobi um, and I am thrilled, delighted, honoured uh, to have Professor John Hattie with us uh, today. Um, it needs no introductions, but for those of you that might not know who he is, um, John Hattie's been the director of the Melbourne Educational Research Institute at the University of Melbourne uh, since 2011. Um, he's authored over 38 books, published, presented. Um, he's really well known in education for over 1,200 research papers um, that he's uh, published and so on. And um, quite often he's been referred to as possibly the world's most influential uh, ed education academic. So, John, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's super early where you are. Um, I'm really uh, thrilled and um, very, very happy and a little bit starstruck to have you uh, with us. It's a pleasure to talk to you, Adol. Pleasure indeed. So, we actually have 30 minutes, which kind of like feels like super short um, and it is super short and I'm sure the time will fly by but um, we're going to go straight into kind of questions and your thoughts on things and, and so on. Um, tell us tell us a little bit about visible learning. There'll be probably might be a lot of new teachers that might be looking at this or educators that don't know about visible learning. I've come across it in a variety of different countries that I've traveled to. So I kind of want to know what is visible learning? How did it happen? What's a visible learner? And so on. In a nutshell, it's um, it's been a hobby for the last many many years, many years looking at this. Because my background is uh, I'm a psychometrician. I teach measurement and statistics, all that lovely stuff. And um, I'm a bit of an outsider as a consequence. And what it, what intrigued me, Abdul, was everybody I met knew truth. They knew what made a difference to kids' learning. And it didn't make sense to me, having been a student myself that everybody was right. And then I started looking at the academic literature and the same thing. Every study you ever find shows that whatever, whatever it is, it can improve learning. And so it was that notion of could I take the many influences that are out there and put them across a line in terms of those that made the biggest difference, middle and lowest, and change the question from what works in education, because the answer seems to be everything, to what works best and change the whole nature of how we look at things. And so I started on that. And then, you know, obviously it got more and more complicated as more and more studies came in. And then, the, then it switched to what is the underlying big ideas about that, that which discriminates those teachers and schools that have big effects and those who have little effects. And that's why it took me about 15 years to write that book, to try and work out those big ideas. Um, and I'm sad to say, or delighted to say, I'm, I'm still continuing. Um, uh, in 2009, when the book came out, I had two 800 meta-analyses. I'm now just past 1,800. So the world still increases. But it's constantly looking for that story. Um, you, you know, Abdel, you've, you're, you're a principal. You've been running schools. Everybody comes to you and tries to tell you, you should do what I do. Every politician. Now, every politician, when they introduce a policy, of course they'll find evidence to support it because everybody can. <laughs> So let's change the nature and let's up the ante. And here's the good news. When you look at, like in your country, I can say with a lot of confidence, having analysed a lot of the data from your country, that 60% plus of teachers and schools are already in that desirable zone, zone yeah, above that yeah. average where their kids are getting more than a year's yeah. growth for a year's input. That's unbelievably impressive. And it's that, and I have a political job here in Australia, and my argument is, Let's stop looking for failure to try and fix it. Let's yeah. start looking for success and scaling it up. And my challenge, particularly to my um, colleagues in the academic business, is that if you ask how many articles have ever been written about scaling up success in education in the history, I'm up to seven. <laughs> we don't do that. But you know in your job, when you're a, print, when you're a principal, you're looking for the success. You're trying to form a coalition around that success. But do you have the courage to then invite those that are not up to scratch yeah. to become part of that coalition? And so my yeah. argument is the biggest problem out there is the lack of courage. 
that, that's kind of really, really quite powerful and very telling in many ways. You know, one of the things that I, I kind of, um, that, that I've always believed in is that, um, and, and I say this as, as a statement when I'm meeting with, with school leaders as well, is that um, good schools are consistent. Outstanding schools are consistently good. So what I mean by that is, like that consistency of good stuff. It's not necessarily about being wow all the time, but how can we establish a minimum of kind of like a good good learning environment? So one of the things that, that I probably want to ask you in terms of building that kind of consistency, um, and, and this is probably a question that you could do a lecture on, but what would you say are the most important things a teacher could do to kind of improve learning or improve outcomes in their classroom where should their focus focus be well the line we use abdul similar to yours is we say great teaching by design not by chance and the three things um that uh, the, you know the top things i would look at is, is the first one is shut up and listen <laughs> and i say that ironically because i'm a, a very good talker now when, when we did an analysis in fact very close to where you live in um in manchester of a number of schools, and we've done it right across England and other parts. We have about seventeen to 20,000 teachers and their transcripts of their classes. And in the analysis of that, what percentage of time do teachers talk? Mm. 90% of the time. Yeah. They ask 150 yeah. to 250 questions a day requiring less than three words response. 90% yeah. is about the facts. If we want to hear our impact, we're going to have to shut up more and listen to the students. And that's been the real power of COVID teaching. We couldn't talk online 90% of the time. We couldn't keep focused on surface level questions. We, we switched to triage like nurses and listened. And, yeah. and we were very good at it. And so that would be yeah. my first comment. The second one would be, um, same study. We, we, we looked for examples when teachers either explained to students that think aloud about how they were processing whatever the problem was, yeah. Or they listened to the students about how they went about processing. And we, after 4,000 hours of looking through transcripts, we gave up because we couldn't find a single one. So that would be my second one is how do you get see learning through the eyes of the students? Listen to how yeah. they process. Now, there's a conspiracy out there, and that is kids above average want you to talk more about the facts because that's the game they're good at. It's the kids below average that want to hear the thinking. And once again, Think of what happened in COVID teaching. Many of the kids use social media to think aloud, to talk with their colleagues, yeah. to talk to the teacher. They use yeah. the chat. I think that's really powerful. We need more focus on how we learn, less on how we teach, more on how we learn. And the, and the third one is, it's a jargony word, but I'm going to use it, constructive alignment. How do we yeah. make sure we align the success of the lesson with the learning strategies, with the assessment and the tasks? Whereas too often what we do is we start with, the, oh, that's an interesting activity. We'll do that. And so <laughs> classes have a whole series of activities as opposed to a short story where there is a purpose, there is a dialogue, there is a flow. So that would be the ones that I worry about. And you can see that I'm, I'm not telling you how to teach. I'm not telling you about yeah. teaching method. I think yeah. teachers are very good at that. I'm asking yeah. you instead to turn it on its head and listen to how the students are learning. So that would be my, my big ones. That that's that yeah, that's 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 pretty pretty powerful stuff. Just something that you said there, hearing the thinking. That's that's something that's kind of really just resonated with me and fired all sorts of synapses in my brain. But um, hearing the thinking is actually really powerful. That as a concept as itself, getting students to speak and explain what it is that they're thinking, what's going on in their minds. I mean. You know, if we think about the traditional approaches to learning, we, I mean, I was a science teacher for many years and we'd be like, show your working out, you know, show me the steps and so on. Um, I think one thing that I've certainly been quite passionate about and um, is this whole concept of kind of like verbal feedback, voice feedback. I know before we came on, we were speaking about this, yeah. Um, and yes, Shobi is kind of, it's a technology company and all that kind of stuff. But one thing that I kind of find really interesting, and we used it at my school, I've been using it with other educators as well, is the development of the idea that actually if a student is solving a problem, 
the fact that you can ask them, and I'm, I'm almost feel like I'm gonna, I'm gonna steal this off you, John, blatantly. It's gonna be on a slide. Yeah, I want to hear your thinking. Yeah, um, the the ability to to add a voice note anywhere and be able to ask a student, can you explain this? Or I want to hear your thinking. Um, like that for me is kind of changing the game a little bit in the type of tasks that we can set children right um and i'm just thinking about your thoughts on that because historically we would be marking books and you know i taught in the classroom at a time when it was all marking books and i know for a fact which students the the number of students that might respond to a comment that i might write is going to be very very few and far between um but the idea of, hey, I'm speaking to you and I want you to explain this and it's just they're going to have to talk and explain, um, that potentially um, might help close that kind of feedback loop and so on. But just your thoughts on that kind of that idea of, you know, hearing the thinking. Wow. Well, let, let me ask you a question then, Abdel. How do you yeah. think? Yeah, it's it's voices in my head. It's 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 sound. It's I hear myself. Right, let me, let me ask the next question. Now I want you to write it down. <laughs> yeah. The difference is that when we, the assumption we make is that we actually know how we think. Now we think we know how we think, but when I give you a particular problem, and yeah. you think, when you then ask to write it down, you change how you think about how you were thinking. Yeah, And this is why the work you're doing with doing it verbal, it cuts out that extra step. And yeah. think of those kids that say are below average that you're asking now an extra load on their cognition to write it down. Yeah. Many of them struggle yeah. to do that and therefore they lose it. So I'm with you that we need to have more verbal. But let, let me also then tie it into something else. Like around the world, your country, my country, we have all issues with equity. We have all issues with minority kids and majority classes. Yeah. What? bigger form of respect is there than demonstrating that you're listening to another person wow wow listening Absolutely. is so underestimated in terms of the power of what we do in classrooms we demand the students listen to us as teachers because yeah. it's a desirable thing we think i want both i want us to think listen to the students thinking and obviously wow. that's the groundwork for improving it yeah yeah absolutely Absolutely. I can really kind of uh, uh, see that. You know, I went through um, the school where I used to work at in my hometown um, it went through this sudden change. So I was there for like 10 years, 12 years. And then suddenly we had a huge influx of refugees that came in from countries like Iraq and Afghanistan when the war first happened. It completely changed the demographics of the school. It meant that we had children that were intelligent, that had cognition, but didn't have the language. Um, and, you know, I can speak Urdu, for example, I can speak Gujarati, I could communicate with some of those students and they, could, they, they couldn't score in maths, they couldn't score in English, they couldn't score in geography. But when I spoke to them, these were really intelligent kids, like they could articulate things in their language and I really and we kind of look, explored lots of options we looked at technology we looked at tools we did a one-to-one -one program because we wanted just to kind of give them access use tools to translate and all this kind of stuff um but at that point um it really got me thinking about the whole voice and the human connection and I kind of feel I suppose it's leading up to my next question that in 2021 um, we're still kind of judging students by the one hour they sit for an exam, right? Um, after two years, five years of study and so on. So my kind of question is, is that, you know, are we, are we striving or why are we striving for this kind of assessment capable learner? or a not a kind of self-regulated learner where, or, you know, any other type of learner where we're actually measuring you know, the, the ability for them to, to actually learn and their cognition and their, you know, their ability to kind of um, learn new things, you know. Um, I don't know. Um, it's a big, a big question, but we yeah, love your lots thoughts. Lots in there. Let me I start know. then. Um, like, let's take the word self-regulation. Like, it's a very powerful notion. It's a very jargon notion. 
And when I talk to a lot of people about that, the assumption is they know what I'm talking about. And it sometimes it isn't the case. So I want to make it an easier concept. And that is when students become their own teachers. Yeah. Everything then follows from that. And the reason we used assessment capable learners is we took the argument we were looking at assessment that our job as to teachers is to teach kids how to interpret their assessments. It's their data. It's theirs. But we don't. We throw things back at them and assume that therefore they understand or even worse, when we throw things back to them in assessment, it often says to the student, the work is over. And we said, no, it's the other way around. That, that's the starting point for where we go next. So we have to teach the students how to interpret that. And here's the good news. If that's our logic and that's the way we think, we're going to have to do that too as teachers to say, well, what do we do next? So my challenge to you is that when you give an assessment in a class, I'll come back to you, Abdul, and say, what did you learn about what you had impact about who you had impact with and how much impact. And if you can't answer that question, you've just wasted the kid's time. Because I bet that before any kid does any assessment, if you said to them, before you do the assessment, even before you see it, put what grade you think you're gonna get. After age eight, they're pretty accurate. They don't learn a lot from assessments. And so if you don't, they won't. So that's the first part. The second part on exams, like I, I look at the English system of, the high stakes exam at the end and think, when are you ever going to learn? You tell me <laughs> any industry, any industry that has a final exam. You tell me virtually any university in England that is now focused on the final exam. Yeah. Unfortunately, some of your schools are very good at playing that game of getting kids ready for final exams. Some kids, the conspiracy is a lot of those above average kids love facts, teacher talking, the final exams, because that's the game they got at. When I was working in New Zealand in the early 2000s, we abolished them overnight, disappeared. We said, it's bonkers. Now, the universities got upset and we said, yeah, tough. We're not here to as to create fodder for you. We're here to develop kids. And what we did instead is we created a whole, we said, we're going to certify kids on the basis of what they can do. Now, that turned out to be a bit of a mistake because we forgot something. And it was a disaster in the early years until we remembered we're going to certify kids about what they can do and the level of excellence they can do it. There had to be a oh, quality to be. Right. And so okay. we introduced this whole new system. And at the time, one of the biggest problems was our retention rate in schools. We had about an 80% retention rate at the end of high school. After introducing this new examination system, it went up to 92%. And you can imagine which kids profited from it. And we yeah. said, and this was a dangerous statement, but a statement I'll defend, you can be excellent as a panel beater and the same way you can be excellent as a chemistry teacher, a student. And the chemist got very upset, saying, oh, no, our subject's much more difficult. Well, <laughs> for a panel beater, that's not necessarily true. And yeah. so that's how the model works. It's been now in place 20 years. It's highly successful. Some schools decided not to play that game and have stayed on with the A and the O levels and the Cambridge and all that. Their students, because I've done the study, their students don't do as well at universities because universities don't demand those skills anymore. No, so no. On earth are you going to wake up and get rid no. of your high stakes exactly. not helping um, your Absolutely, John. I, I totally agree with you. I mean, you know, it was kind of, in some ways, quite comical, like during COVID when exams got cancelled, like trying to figure out, hey, how are we going to assess these kids? And just the concept of, like, you know, teachers being able to grade the kids was kind of sounding a bit scary for people. Right. I mean, bottom line, the teachers spent five years with the students. They kind of know like what they can do. And but that trust I, I felt and this was my own personal opinion, wasn't kind of really there uh, from the top where to kind of take that uh, as the yeah, view. Yeah. Ronald yeah. Reagan got it right. Trust, but verify. Yes, there yeah. has to be systems in place to make sure that the standards are appropriate. And in the New Zealand system, I can guarantee to you, and I know you were a chemistry teacher, that if you go yeah. into any chemistry school in the last three years of high school, you will have the same standards because we've worked very hard on making sure that happens. So then and, we can and, then... Yeah, and I believe in, in New Zealand, there's a lot of cross-correlation and stuff that happens, right, yes. between teachers and stuff. So you can't really, you know, nobody can give a, a, a kind of exaggerated grade out no, because it gets nullified right. because there's that many teachers... Yep. 
That's right. Now, don't don't for a moment think there aren't exams. There are. There are exams yeah. as you do the work about the work you've done. Yeah. It's not an event at the end of the year. Yeah. And there is an accumulation yeah. of evidence. But yeah. what it's done to teachers, and teachers didn't appreciate this at the time, but they do now, it turned teachers into supporters of the kids, developers of the kids, not judges. Yeah. And, and that was their major role in the exam system. It's going to be on the exam. You have to do it. They had to turn yeah. it on its head and say, well, how do we help you get to the standard? And if you're a C student, how do I get you to a B student? So it changed the dynamics and it got teachers back to the job of teaching. It was a very, very successful intervention. So come on, England, yeah. any country that uses the final exam, you're the last <laughs> in the world. Get over it. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Here, here on that one, um, uh, John. Absolutely. I think, I, I just think like, if when we speak to teachers here, um, the, the the kind of workload issues, the the, the fact that you know they they might have inspections happening, the fact that they've got to prepare for exams, and so it's not really, um, you know, it's it's not a, a picture that gets paid, painted quite well. But there are fantastic leaders in schools that handle all of that really well, look after the well being of teachers, and you know you kind of also see the other side uh, where. Actually, it's, it's the best job in the world, and teachers kind of want to go in and then want to work for those uh, kind of see, uh, leadership teams as well. Um, but yeah, I absolutely, kind of uh, agree with that. Um, okay, I'm kind of um, looking at time, and we've kind of got nine minutes left. Um, there was something that we were speaking about earlier on, and we were talking about the whole voice feedback stuff, um, and that's the teacher connection with the student, right? Um, so being able to record audio, being able to speak with teachers and so on, um, which is, and then the students being able to hear the teacher's voice and so on. And you um, um, kind of um, talked about how you'd, um, come across an AI system that did that. So I'd love to hear you kind of explain that and kind of look at the, the pros and cons of that. Shobi's kind of been in the forefront of this kind of, you know, um, voice feedback stuff and and and, and kind of, um, um, you know, the, the student-teacher connection um, and, and developing that um, so that all students can connect, they can all speak, they can talk, they can um, leave voice notes for each other and all that kind of stuff. So... And of course, that's with their real teacher. But how does would that weigh up against like the AI system that you were kind of talking about? Well, it was the experience of watching a class being taught by a robot in Japan. And in that class, a very anthropomorphic robot, uh, I had the opportunity of talking to the students afterwards. And what was really impressive is the students loved it. Some of them didn't, but most of them loved it. And when I asked them why, they said, well, the, the robot didn't know I had ADHD. The, the robot didn't know I was the naughty kid. I could ask the robot 10 times and it never got frustrated. And it was really an interesting notion that we as humans have to spend a lot of time on building relationships for safety so kids can make errors. And sometimes we forget there's a purpose for building those relationships. And that is so that kids can say, I don't know, I'm confused. But they tend not to in class. And so teachers... From kids' point of view, they're listening very clearly to that emotion. They're listening to the words. And, hey, they're humans. They're very good at self-selection. Like when I listen to feedback from my partner, I'm very self-selective. I listen to all the good stuff. Because <laughs> I know when she tells me the stuff I got wrong, I'm, it's going to cost. I'm going to have to do it again. So I don't hear it. In the same way with kids, when you talk, give feedback to the whole class, every kid knows it's not about them. And so this is, again, I, I go to COVID teaching. During COVID teaching, kids were much more willing to use the social media aspects of technology to talk yeah. about what they didn't know with their friends and with the teacher that they're not prepared to do in a classroom. Yeah. So I see that the social side of the technology is the biggest revolution confronting us at the moment if we're only prepared to be brave and use it. Yes, it's yeah. got some downsides. We know that. Yeah. But yeah. our students are very good at giving feedback over technology for good and bad. Yeah. But how yeah. do we capitalize that in the classroom? Because when I'm talking to you, Abdul, I'm yeah. listening for main idea. I'm listening to how I can add, change, verify question. I'm not decoding every word. Yeah. But when I get it on a piece of paper, yeah. I decode every word and I can see multiple meanings. But in speech, I'm looking for big picture more often. So much easier for kids who struggle in classroom to listen to your speech, but you've got to stop them and say, and what did I say? Because it's not just listening, 
It's yeah. demonstrating you've listened. I think it's a very powerful way of moving forward. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I think, I, I think there's, there's. I mean, you know, I'd love to kind of see. Maybe, maybe we will uh, moving forward be able to kind of see more studies around. Uh, those kinds of things. I know there's been like smaller impact studies that have been carried out with different schools. The UK has um, the EdTech Demonstrator program that's been kind of um, supported by the uh, Department for Education to kind of look at this kind of pedagogy. I know there's a research school here um, that's also kind of looking at the impact of that as well. But uh, I, I really do kind of feel that that kind of human connection um, is uh, can be quite powerful for students and to be able to kind of you know develop that and to kind of have access to that um not that teachers have to be available 24 7 but the fact that the student can walk home with the teacher's voice and be able to to listen to that or be able to connect in that way back to the teacher i think is kind of that flexibility is quite quite powerful in many ways and vice versa the teacher listening to the student yeah yeah absolutely absolutely um okay um John, this is kind of like like thirty minutes kind of gone uh, pretty pretty quickly. Wow. I think we've got about four minutes left or so. Yeah. Um, from your perspective, um, what's kind of next? Is there like visible learning two point or you know is there more stuff that's going to come out around that? If somebody wants to kind of know more uh, about this, um, I know that there's a. Um, the URL that's kind of coming up on the banner underneath, they can certainly go there and, and have a look at that as well. But, um, you know, what, what's next in terms, in, in the world of effect sizes and data and research uh, from you? Well, I'm still trying to look at the whole meta-analysis as I'm up to 1800, so that's keeping me going. Um, we're just um, in the process of, we've just finished a book on visible learning for parents, and I'm very proud Ooh, of that wow. one because I wrote it with my son. Um, and the early childhood one comes out next week. So there's plenty of things that we're doing, reinterpreting it. And, you know, since 2009, we've worked in probably around 10,000 schools a year around the world. And I, I get all the evidence from that and analyze that. So it's not just looking at the matter analysis. It's opening yeah. up what's happening in schools. And so given even though I've retired from my university job, uh, I keep going on that. I also have a political job here in Australia as the chair of the board of um, the Australian Institute for Teachers and School Leaders, which is a federal government. And I love doing that. That's very enjoyable to try and create dialogue and language. And that probably comes to my biggest issue, Abdul, um, is that how do we make sure that underlying our profession is our concept of expertise? Yeah. And I get frustrated because so often teachers deny their expertise. They say it was the kids, it was the, it was the resources, it was the curriculum. No, we're actually very good at doing what we're doing. And we wrote a book this last year called The Turning Point that says the underlying essence of our profession is expertise. And like I know in England now, there are more amateurs in the classroom than there are teachers. There are more teaching aides in the classroom than teachers. Now, I'm not against teaching aides if we use them correctly, but I just worry that we're not investing in that expertise. I worry that our salary structure is based on age more than it's based on expertise. Now, it's a, yeah. a difficult switch to make. But if we're going to attract people into our profession, we're going to have to say it's the expertise that gets promoted. Like at, in Australia, the average age of coming into teacher education is 26. The average age of being registered for a teacher for the first time is 35. But okay. The hints are teachers are coming in to stay for five or 10 years. It's part of the gig economy. We're working that way. I worry about whether teaching is going to become a career. That's why I'm obsessed that it is that expertise. It's what we've been talking about, Abdul. We know that we have an incredible amount of expertise, but we don't esteem it. We don't respect it. Right at the moment, given COVID, every parent knows that teachers have incredible expertise. I think we need to be smart about how we capture that sensitive conversation, but by denying it and ignoring it, we're killing our profession. So that's my thing at the moment. How do we get expertise back in the front? That's 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 quite powerful. Is so. F this is probably going to be, end up being the last question because of time. Is there a country that's getting the expertise part right, or actually better than others? Well, yes, there are, but I'm always fearful of going to another country and adopting it. Like Singapore model of um, teachers, and after two years of being a teacher, decide to specialize as being a teacher, being a leader or being a specialist. And then their professional learning is related to that and they build their expertise. 
Their career structure is based around that. There's a lot of good stuff in that, in that kind of model. Other countries are starting to look at that model. We here in Australia are creating that debate in our organization around the country. Uh, a lot of resistance. Um, age is a much more powerful denominator, particularly if you are older in the profession. Mm. The threat yeah. that your yeah. salary won't be a function of age is a threat. Uh, yeah. I don't see why we can't have both experience and expertise. But I just want that expertise. So, yes, there are some countries, uh, some of the places in Canada are looking at these kinds of models. But it's a hard thing to get on the table because history is and, so dominant here. And actually, in some ways, um, I suppose, you know, professional development would have a big role to kind of play in this. Um, and, um, you know, a, a lot of school models and school leaders that I speak to even now, that professional development happens once in six months or once in four months and, and so on. And there isn't kind of like um, a dedicated time in the week for, for best practice to be shared. I mean, to be honest with you, it's not about learning new things. Um, I, I always feel there's always amazing stuff going on in every school, but there's just never the opportunity to share and collaborate that. Um, I remember many years ago introducing something called One Best Thing. Teachers get three minutes just to share the best thing that they did, what worked for them pedagogically, but also they could have a choice of sharing one my one worst thing, what didn't work? What did I try and it didn't work, right? And there's kind of discussions that came up. But that was a weekly session that used to happen. And it was phenomenally powerful. You know, people would develop, they would grow and so on. But, um, you know, we, we still kind of um, don't have that degree of investment happening across schools, certainly not here uh, in the UK. So, yeah, I mean, um, I can I can kind of see. And, and I, I think a lot of, some of your research has pointed to that as well, right? From... Uh, the, the quality of teachers was it teachers working together to work teachers working together uh, maybe you know part of the evaluation if I think the effect size of that was was pretty large compared to everything else right absolutely yeah no you're spot on there it's how, how we get that expertise thinking aloud so yes we could talk for hours about this and I'm thoroughly enjoying it Abdul thank you <laughs> John look oh my god I'm looking at the time now and it's gone over time and, and, and my wife's messaging me as well that, oh you're taking too much of his time now um <laughs> so anyway um here we are um John I can't I can't thank you enough for taking your time out very early hours of the morning for you as well um this has been an absolute pleasure and um probably a moment in time for me as well um i'd love to kind of have more conversations with you i'll be kind of reaching out with other stuff that we're doing as well um and of course um you know um hopefully at some point when the world opens up a bit more we will get to to sit on great ocean road in melbourne and and have to have a coffee together Sounds wonderful. Thank you for my friend. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. Thank you.